Just a quick reminder that if you want to support Concepts and Legends, please remember to like and subscribe. And you can also show your support by using our TCG affiliate link for any and all of your magic needs by using the link you see here or below in the description. Any and all help is greatly appreciated and helps us bring you more videos like the one that is starting right now. Hello, Lich Lord and ladies. Do you like RPGs? You do? Well, then today's interview is the name that you might recognize. Artist Ralph Horsley. MTG, RPGs, D&D, &D, OMG. What else has Ralph done? Well, let's find out, shall we? Well, thank you so much for doing this. I appreciate you joining. And um, my first question to you is, um, being an English, uh, edu uh, English um, education master's student myself, um, you started out as an English student originally before you uh, decided to do a career in art, correct? That's right. I've got a degree in English, English literature. What were your favorite um, like books that you were studying and, and what caused you to sort of do that sort of like, like right turn into art and, and when you were already so well, fully educated? I, actually, the thing that I enjoyed most was the, the course I did with American Studies. <laughs> so there's a lot of American literature that I really enjoyed, to be honest. So, um, you know, um, uh, but the, in some ways, it wasn't a sort of severe right turn in that I'd always been drawing and painting and, and passionate about gaming uh, as, as, a, as a boy and as a teenager, as a young man. And I'd been involved in fanzines and things like that. But I never really saw it as a career choice. And, and also the, the route for going into art education in the UK didn't particularly appeal to me at the time. It would have, you know, some of the, some of the choices that would be forced upon me would have meant going to places I didn't really want to go, a university I didn't really want to go to and things like that because of funding issues and what have you. So um, it was really whilst I was at university that, I don't know, you mature a bit, you think more about maybe what you want to do with your life, you move away from home for the first time, things like that. And I thought that really I wanted to give my art a serious go. I'd like to make a serious attempt at trying to make a living out of doing that. Um, I think I was maybe fortunate in that I was naive enough not to realise how bad I was. I'm sorry. I was going to say I was quite stubborn as well. So I spent most of my 20s sort of teaching myself how to how to get good enough to get professional work, really. And so were you, did you have a supportive family when you did all that? Well, supportive in the sense that my parents, you know, were, were happy. For, well, they were worried about the decisions I made. They didn't support me financially, but they supported me emotionally, I suppose. They were all, you know, supportive in that sense. But they were concerned that maybe I was making a wrong choice. <laughs> <laughs> I think that that's a big, I think that's a big part of, of a success. I think if you have parents who are, are behind you. I think that that helps a lot um, because the emotional support seems to be, I've noticed that there are more people who go towards success. Determination is stronger in people. And, and, and I'd say that a lot of your career is very, is very much, a, 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 it's very much um, due to the fact you were so determined. Well, yes, I, I, you need, well, you need a certain amount of perseverance, I suppose, really. Uh, but also making the most opportunities when they come along and putting yourself out there and, and creating opportunities. Um, and it was certainly a bit, a bit harder when I started out because there was no internet, <laughs> you know, everything was done by post. It was a, it was a different process, um, which is maybe why the idea of working for American companies at the time seemed quite a remote possibility. But I was very fortunate and I started working for some UK companies and I got to work with Games Workshop as a freelancer. Um, and that really took me down the games route. And then, of course, internet came along, email came along, and things became more accessible. And, and I, I was lucky that that groundwork had already done, got me work with, with people like Wizards of the Coast and whatever else. Yeah, and it sort of took off from there. How did you originally get connected with Wizards? Well, two ways. Um, for, for working on Magic the Gathering, uh, it was because I was fortunate enough to meet Kev Walker at a UK convention and he was chatting about working on magic and you know we hit it off and he said oh I, I recommend you to Jeremy Camford who's the art director at the time and so I mean you can't get much of a better recommendation than Kev Walker I suppose and yeah. that got me my and that got me my first work on Magic the Gathering um, and then work on on uh, D&D followed down the line really. And yet in another interview you had said that 
sometimes you also get to the point where you um you are not even able to look at the pieces anymore when you're finished with them um what what causes that paradox like what would make one piece have you get emotionally attached to it where the other one you get so tired of seeing it you don't want to see it for a long time well, I think, I don't know, maybe it is part of the process. I mean, maybe it's because you're obviously struggling to do your best work and whatever that whatever that criteria is or, or um, I suppose, well, let me think about that again. Maybe it's a mix of different things. Maybe some of it is subject matter, but I think a large part of it is, is actually the process. So maybe a piece you fall in love with is one where each step of the way it seems to come together. You know, it flows. You've got that, it, there's that, magical word flow when you're in the flow of when something's just going right yeah you feel that you're at, at the top of your game and and there are pieces like that where for whatever reason from start to finish everything just seems to fall into place and and you know and that's maybe why yes i can feel particularly fond of those pieces because they i don't know they they feel just they just feel right in every respect and, and you can you can look at it at the end and go yeah i'm happy with that i feel i did my best work i could do at, at the time on that piece and there's other ones where you just feel like you struggle and it just doesn't come together and I don't know by the end of it you're just sick of it you know you feel like I can almost feel embarrassed to share it even though you know objectively it's of an okay standard but within myself I feel like it didn't quite come together or sometimes just it just seems like a struggle to mix the paint even <laughs> Yeah, because you guys and I've, I, with other artists I've spoken to, you guys have that that uh, very private hell issue of seeing it through your own like harsh lens, and we don't get to see it that way. No, no, well, that's not thing. I mean, I suppose as you, as you, as you get more experience, I can be more objective about my work now. But um, but yes, it's. I think you're always more critical of your own work because you you can understand the process. It's always, I suppose, when you see even though I can analyze another artist's work and break it down and maybe sort of see what they're doing and, and, and analyze their process, it's still like a complete finished thing. You don't really see, you know, how it's created. Um, whilst with your own work, you can see every stage and you can see that bit where that, okay, that hand doesn't look quite right to me or I didn't quite pull the lighting off there. With other people, maybe they don't see the flaws. They don't see what you didn't achieve. They only see what you have achieved. Has there been any pieces over the years that you were initially uh, critical of that you've grown to uh, like have a better relationship with? I think that's probably true of a lot of them, actually, because I found that often when I finish the piece, I might be, you know, those are the two extremes we've discussed, either being in love with it or hating it. But usually it's somewhere in between. You sort of think, yeah, fine, that's okay. I did a decent job. I'm, I'm happy enough with that. But there's usually something you feel you could have done better or some improvement or or just sometimes just having finished a job, you just, you just want to put it to one side. And, and it can take, it's only maybe later when you look back and you can reflect better, you can see that, oh no, actually, it was taking a step forward with that, or it, or it wasn't as bad as I thought it was. It, it, you know, that passage of time helps put it in context, really. Um, yeah. And so, now your but your education in art is not as is not as um traditional right as uh, you would say the, your other educations are you are you are pretty much from what i understand 100% self taught yes i mean i did you know well the american equivalent would be high school i did it up to sort of you know when i was 18 i did art at school and that was it you know that doesn't count i mean <laughs> <laughs> no and they, and to be honest there wasn't much there wasn't much in the way of teaching in the last couple of years the, the teacher i had was a nice guy he was very, but he's very hands off. <laughs> uh, uh, yes. So, so uh, you know, it was a nice environment to go and sit and do what you wanted, but it wasn't. There wasn't a lot of teaching going on. So is, yeah, no, I'm. So, is it funny? So, yes, I'm very, well, in some regards, yes, but um, but but yeah. So so I am self taught. Um, how long did it take you? Because one piece that I, I'm staring at is um the dive. Um, that was one that you did as a commission. Uh, are you allowed to talk about like what uh, when somebody commissions something from you? Are you allowed to um, explain the details of what what it was give what were give what was given to you to do the piece and and how it came about? Because I'm curious, how does somebody do that? How does somebody commission an artist and what are the steps that one takes and and what what was the uh, discussion that led to that one? That one's uh, incredible. Well, that was a, that was a private commission, so it was slightly different. Pro well, I suppose this process is very similar in some ways to a to a publisher commissioning you. That, that particular person who I did that work for had, had bought um, 
I think he bought a couple of originals off me previously. And I had done one piece prior to that. So, but the process essentially was he said, look, you know, I'd like to hire you to do a private commission. This is what I've got in mind. Are you available? What would you charge or something like that? So that's that's the sort of negotiation you have. Um, I suppose that's the, the bare bones of it. And then as far as the actual content went, he was he was very um it was quite a loose brief, really, which is which is quite sweet to me. So he wanted four key characters, which if you look in the center of the picture, there are four four key characters, one of which is based on him, one of which is based on his son. Um, so those were the those were the elements he wanted in there. And he wanted it to be a barroom, fantasy barroom brawl uh, themed around Dungeons and Dragons. So there'd be elements there that would be recognizable from Dungeons and Dragons. So there's like a teeth thing in there and the other thing. And it's and it's those sort of fantasy tropes, but really it was pretty aloof. So what I did with that, I would take that and as with any other commission, I'd work up a series of thumbnail composition studies, which you know I presented him and he said, Oh, well, I like the way this one's going. So there's a bit of give and take on that. And then of course. As with other commissions, I would then work up a fully realised sketch, which again was given to him for a, for approval, which you know he didn't want any changes. That was great. And then I would do sort of colour study and think about how I wanted to actually paint it, and then the actual painting process. So that that process is the same as I would do for any commercial commission, really. Um, but it was nice for him because I suppose he he wasn't trying to sell a product at the end. He wanted to go on his wall and fulfil a different function, you know. So. That was it was a nice nice loose brief how did you decide the colors i mean how do you decide the colors like i mean the oranges and all that stuff it's, it's such a cool uh cool idea and i imagine without any formal um like traditional um education you don't get to you don't have those sort of those analytical tools that they give people in art school so how do you how do you come to those decisions well i mean i have read various things on color theory i have educated myself since you know i do have some ideas i mean with that particular one it's actually a very muted palette and so it's very in some ways it's quite a um a limited palette but i i felt that was the way i wanted to render that for the mood and, and it allowed for little nuances of color in there so the thing about it as well is that it's designed a lot of stuff you design to be a book cover or a card art let's say for magic to be read at a certain size or seen across a you know the other side of a bookshop and leap off the, the the stand to catch people's eye that of course wasn't designed like that it's it's a five foot by three three and a half foot painting designed to go on the wall of someone's house so the way you would read it and the way you'd engage with it is slightly different so that i think that allowed me to to go for a slightly different color scheme than i might might do for a, say a book cover um you know, and there's a lot of different focal points, and it's so busy and so full that, say, a cover you might, or a piece of card art, you might be looking for one focal point, and then everything else sort of spills out from that. But with that particular piece, although there is sort of key elements in the centre of the picture, I want there to be lots of focal points in a way, or your eye to be led around it, which is what the function of the different lights on the tables and the lamps and things like that work intersected with the odd little magic effect, which is usually where you get this little burst of color and that's really helped draw the eye around um do you remember the first magic the gathering art piece that you did uh i tried to find it it's difficult to find a where pinpoints i know the the era of where you started but i'm not yes. sure the very first the very first card i ever did was kami was was on the kamigawa set it was rag dealer and the second one i ever did was besiju and looking back on Yes, that's right. The first magic card I ever painted was Rag Dealer, and, and the second one was Besiejo. <laughs> <laughs> would you, looking back on it now, was there any way you could have predicted that you would have uh, such, a, getting a, that you would be getting involved with such an iconic game? Did you know that it was going to be what it be, has become today? I knew at the time it was an iconic, it already had a good reputation, you know, it was already very well established getting when I came on board. I think it's, I don't think I appreciated quite the impact it have on my career or, or impact in general. Um, it was a, you know, it was another gig. It was another, it was a, it was a good job to do. I, you know, everyone said it was a good job to do. It was a sort of good profile and whatever else. Um, so I was, and I was very happy to get the work. It was, it was certainly, it's certainly well paid work compared with everything else I was doing. And, you know, but I was also apprehensive about it. I did feel a pressure to do it. Pressure, pressure of, 
wanting to do a good job on it. And then what's interesting about your pieces too is that you you came in, you had sort of you had you know you started off the way most people do, where you know you kind of like blend into the fold, and then all of a sudden, uh, then you just are just thrown in and used like hardcore in the um on unstable set. You you were sort of like put in there, you know, kind of your, your work was kind of uh, introduced, you know, the, the traditional way sort of, uh, you know, like bit by bit. And then all of a sudden you're slammed in there with the unstable set. You did, you did a ton of art for that one. And, um, well, that, it's, well, it's, it's, well, it's interesting really, because prior to unstable, I hadn't actually done much work on magic for a couple of years, really. I mean, yeah. that's the, I think that's the nature often of, of a product as big as that, the art direction changes, art directors change. You know, um, I think prior to that, I, the last set I'd done a lot of work on had been the Law Win and Shadow Moor sets. And I'd done quite a few cards on that. But after that, I hadn't done a great deal. Uh, and in fact, I think I hadn't done anything for about a year and a half when I was asked to take part in the concept push for Unstable. So that was a real treat for me. I actually went over to Seattle and worked in Seattle for three weeks on the concept push. Really? Okay. Can you just describe what that sort of entails without, you know, obviously without uh, giving away the uh, baby with the bathwater? Well, I mean, at the time it was quite interesting because they weren't even sure they were necessarily going to go ahead with the set. It was, you know, still very much like, uh, I think, you know, some some people within the, the, the company wanted to be keen on it. Other people, you know, basically because it was going to step outside of the general trend of sets. Um, it was, still almost, it was still almost at the developmental stage. So compared with some of the other concept pushes, it was a smaller team. There was only three of us. There was myself, Chuck Lukacs, and Jesper Ising. So some of the concept pushes now maybe have about eight or ten artists or something like that on it. So there was only the three of us. And wow. it was really nice because, because the, the, first, the first few days was basically, here's the, the rough brief we've got. Just go away and brainstorm it and come up with as many different ideas as you can along the different themes and motifs that we've got, which was basically along the different faction lines. So there was the sneak and there was, you know, I can't remember what all the different ones are now, but, you know, there's all the different sort of faction types. Um, and we just banged out ideas. The three of us sat in this room just banging out ideas. And, and then, you know, in later, a few days later, we basically had a big notice board. Everything was pinned on this, this board. We, as we did work, it's pinned up. And then there'd be a review. And the review go right, we like the way that's going. This one is closed, but maybe if tweak it this way, that one, okay, glad you explored that idea, but we're not thinking that's quite how this is going. And, and it's, so it was an evolutionary process. And of course, as you got towards the third week, it got more and more refined. And then you say, okay, there's a gap. We haven't covered that. We haven't covered the environments or we haven't covered, you know, these elements. So, yeah, so that was, that was really exciting and, and great to be involved. And then, of course, Consequently, that's why I was given a lot of art on it because I'd worked on the concept, and I was, you know, I, it was great to then take those concepts and develop them. But not only that, but see other artists develop them and develop them even better than I've done, which is great, you know. So um, yes, and it was a real treat to do the contraption and to do the sneak contraption. That yeah. was an epic undertaking. Yeah, the, that that one is great too. That one's great. I love that one, and the one obviously the one that I have behind me. Um, how do you? Uh, what, what was the, uh, I mean, excuse my ignorance, but the, the, the um, medium that you used is what on, on hypnotic squirrely disc? Oils. How do you, how do you do that with, I mean, it's got geometry in it. How do you, how, yeah, does, well, I, I, how do you do it? Ed? I had a French, well, that one actually was a challenge. I had, I've got a French curve, which I, I, I think, I might, well, I might have, anyway, do you know what a French curve looks like? I do um, not, no. Okay, let's see if I can find one for you. Um, <laughs> so this sort of device, basically. Ah. This one's a bit battered, actually, but anyway. So, yes, yeah, so if you can imagine, I, I, I found one that was appropriate, the correct shape, and then measured, you know, basically there's lots of measuring and lots of, rotating round and then rotating the other way <laughs> to create the tough? optical illusion. Was that difficult? Yeah, it was tough. It did, I, well, it, it, once I worked out how to do it, uh, but yes, it, it, it just took a long time. It did, it, did drive, it did drive me a bit potty. And actually painting it, looking at it, I found I was getting... <laughs> oh, right. <laughs> when, you look at it too, 
close it, we'd actually quite sort of, I'd have to take a break every now and then because it, it was, you know, yeah, it was doing funny things to my, my eyesight. <laughs> You're getting hypnotized by your own swirly disc. <laughs> it's funny. Yeah. It's funny. But, I mean, but I felt, but, but it was one of the things where I felt it would be worth the effort. And I do feel actually one of my favorites from that set is the swirly disc because I think it did, it did, you know, it did pull off what I was aiming for, really. Yeah. Yeah. It was worth, it was worth the work, is, is what I'm gathering. Yeah. Um, and also, I like the fact, you know, one, one thing that I do like about working tradition is you do, you know, it isn't perfect. It does, it does look handmade. You know, it, it's, it, I haven't, done it on photoshop if you know what i mean where everything would be perfect every one of those little whatever you want to call them that's where the like little square well what anyway every little bit would be exactly exactly accurate the fact that there is little imperfection isn't there i quite like that i think it gives you know it, it sort of works for me really yeah it gives it an organic feel to it yeah, yeah. it's yeah it, it, it's it's it i guess yeah if it was almost like i feel like if it was done on a photoshop like type program it would be really difficult to look at without like maybe even you might just pass out because it would just be too severe <laughs> well what, what means what i could have done you see is i could because i do i can work digitally and i do everything ends up as a digital file so i could have painted it and then drop you know found uh, an optical effect or and you know and pasted it in you know i could have done something like that but i chose to do it traditionally because i wanted i wanted that effect basically do you think that after you did the onset, uh, do you think that that carried over into other pieces? Because I feel like it was such a, a creative freedom that you guys had with doing the, the uh, you know, there were not a lot of borders. It was a lot of colors. You were able to go down those roads. Do you think that that also was sort of like moved into other pieces as you went along? Um, I don't know, actually. Yeah, it's a good question. Um... I don't know how directly it did, but I think I think certainly the just experience of doing such a big project and and also it was is when I transitioned over towards oils. I hadn't been using oil that long when I did it, so there was a lot certainly a lot of learning for me going into it. Um, so maybe that does apply through to other stuff that I've done since. What were you using before oils? Acrylics. I, I grew up using acrylics, and I used them for a long time. I think it's. Probably, I don't know, certainly within the last 10 years, probably less actually, I've switched over to oils now. What would you say the switch uh, has, what, what's the benefits of oils versus acrylics? Well, there's a, there's a rule, someone said to me once, oh, oh, there's a bit of a rule of thumb with, with uh, between acrylics and, and, and oils. And it's that uh, with acrylics, because they dry so fast, they give a nice hard edge. So the thing with acrylics, you're always trying to lose the edge because they're, they're basically harder to blend because they dry so fast. Um, whilst oils, you're trying to gain an edge. So that's the difference really, is that the, the oils are really nice for getting that blending effect and getting painting stuff like clouds and things like that, great fun. And then it's sort of like soft and swirly. I, I really like that. And, and also the ability to lay the color down because the density of the pigment and the way the paints behave, it's just a nice feel. You can get these nice, rich, lush colors. Uh, yeah. It's it's funny. I didn't I didn't paint in oils for a long time, partly because I was self-taught. Uh, I was intimidated by them. I was I was worried about their toxicity. I was worried about the drying time, and also they were a lot more expensive for me. You know, starting out with no income, acrylics. I had acrylics because I had miniature paints. I had you know they were they were easily accessible, and so that's what I taught myself to use because that's what I had to hand. But it got to the point where you know. I spoke to enough other artists who worked at oils and well, how do you cope with these things that I've outlined to you? And of course I got answers. And now I found that yes, I can work on oils and I, by using certain mediums, I can get it to dry pretty much overnight. So that's not an issue. Um, and yeah, I just, it's, I've actually far prefer it as a medium now, but I still use acrylics for doing color studies, for doing stuff on artist proofs, because they are great, they're great for, being able to do things quickly and, and robustly really oils just need a bit more planning mm, yeah that's that makes sense it makes sense um do you still feel the same way about faces i read some somewhere that you had said you you don't like to do uh faces in uh in, in art <laughs> and that you didn't care for i believe it was reminisce which I, I thought was very cool um but then also then what's interesting <laughs> enough and here's another paradox you love anthem of Rakdos, which is pretty much all, like giant faces um has, has your relationship I with think I, 
I don't remember. I don't remember saying that to be honest. I, I, I um, yeah, I think I've probably got a better relationship with faces now. I mean, I've never. I've always enjoyed doing figures, and I've always liked doing more figure scenes. I think the thing was that that I suppose it's still true, really, that you know, it's often the face that carries a character that you've got to get that right, really. You know that that can buy that can sell the art, and certainly certainly it can. I can find doing women's faces a struggle because it's so easy to just shift. You know, if you a man's face, if you're doing a man's face, maybe I don't know. You add an extra line or something, it maybe just gives them more character. It does might make them look a bit older. But with a woman, it can be very easy. That shift between looking young and very attractive and looking older and less so is, is a, can be quite a thin margin, really. <laughs> right, they have more delicate features. So if you you yeah. have yeah, that that makes sense. It's, it's the same. I, I guess it's the same with try probably drawing a, a, like a young person. If you put an extra line in there, they're suddenly go from being like nine to 25 or something well yes yes so that's why it's nice to do goblins and things like that because it doesn't matter right right <laughs> they're all there, pretty there, ugly. <laughs> there's no such thing as a sexy goblin i just don't think that they they are out there. i mean but no offense to goblins you know i don't want to don't want to upset the goblin community but i will say um a cruel ultimatum now i read that you said that you felt that you if you could do it differently, you would have done it more for clarity or focused more on, on clarity or um, something along those lines. Um, what was the the art direction that was told to you on that piece? And because I think it's really cool. There's something so uh, sinister about it and the way that it's lit and the there is such a foreboding. And then the fact that Nicol Bolas became such a huge uh, villain in magic, there's something now I think epic about it. Yeah, so maybe that's something. Maybe that's one of those pieces where it's sort of grown over time, really, in some ways. You know, my relationship with it sort of grown over time. I think it's just look. I am pretty happy with it, really. I think it did sort of cover the brief, which was, which is well, it's pretty self-explanatory. It was, you know, this really powerful demon that's obviously being beaten by a bigger entity, and the the silhouette was to hint at Bolas. Certainly, that was the, that was the the cast shadow. I just think maybe, you know. It could have just made it a bit, a little bit more readable in some ways, but I think it reads pretty well. But I think, yeah, it just maybe make it a bit punchier in, in some of the lighting and things like that. But this is just that's maybe just the nature of, of wanting to be critical about everything I've done because that's how you get better. How did you get chosen to do the two? Uh, one of the, like, say, probably the two most awesome dogs in Magic. Period. You got your trusty retriever and your selfless savior. Uh, where did that? Where did that come about from? Well, I got given self a savior. I don't know why I was assigned that, but I was assigned that to cards, and I think they liked what I did, and I got trusty retriever in the next wave of cards that I was given. So, I mean, I had no idea how good they were going to be at the time or anything. But oh, they're fantastic! I, I mean, just... self a savior is just so, so fucking adorable. <laughs> well, I have that's one painting that I actually do really like. That's one where, as I was doing it, they all really seemed to come together. And it's one actually I've kept. My, my son said he liked it, so I've given it to my son. And it's oh, one of the rare, one of the rare paintings I've actually kept myself and, and I've got hung hung on my walls of my house. So brought you back into the fold um, with because you know you do you just uh, you take a break because you work on you're working on your 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 other you know obviously you've got all your other properties that you're working on outside of Magic the Gathering. Do you wait to hear from them or do you uh, contact them because like it was nice to see you in um, Zendikar Rising too, as well. Um, where where do they like? How does that work? Do they just contact you, or do they want you to do something? Yeah, that's pretty much how it works. They contact me, and you know, maybe you know, the last guy you available to take work on this upcoming set or whatever else. I mean, um, I certainly don't get work on every set, but I'm very appreciative of what I do get, and I've certainly had some interesting cards in the last uh, last year, which will of course come out in about a year's time or whatever so there's certainly stuff to look out for from me in the future which i think will be exciting i'm very excited about some of the work i've done done with them um but as you say it's pretty much you know when i hear from them i don't i don't push it i i respect their art direction and that they they want different artists for different sets with a slightly different look and you know i i'm very appreciative of all the work i've had on magic over the years Ask you about was the book that you're working on. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, sure. Well, I, I 
decided it was about time that I put a, an art book together, uh, you know, a career retrospective in some ways. I feel like I've been working professionally for 30 odd years or something like that. So um, I've got a lot of work there, which I wanted to put out in a book. So I've just recently did a Kickstarter campaign, which went very well. We got over 300% over what we were aiming for as a target. So, and we expanded the book up to like 188 pages. Um, so there's going to be a lot of art in there. It's currently putting it together. The, the last bit of layouts being done by a graphic designer. Um, I'm working on the back cover. Um, uh, and then that'll be it. So it should be ready to go to the printers in the, in the next next few weeks, really. Uh, and yeah, I'm really looking forward to getting that out there. And it's been great the support that people have shown me for that, really. Is it something that is going to be able, are there going to be any additional copies that are not, or that are outside of Kickstarter? Or is it only available for Kickstarter? Yeah. Oh no, sure, sure. No, of, of, course, of course there will be additional copies. Yes, it will. It'll go for sale on my web shop, and it'll be available at conventions and things like that. Yeah, no, absolutely. I'll, I'll, that's that's the point, really. I want it to be a, an ongoing thing that I'll have, I'll have available. Yeah. And um, is there anything else that you're working on now? And it's going to be. Sorry, I was just going to say, and there'll be a lot of Magic the Gathering cards in there. Wizards of the Coast are very kind, and that their their contract allows you to include. Up to six, the content of my book can include up to 60, 66 percent content can be Wizards of the Coast wow. material. So there'll be a so which is very generous. Uh, I mean, I'm, I don't think it'll be anywhere near that level because I've got a lot of other work, but there'll be probably most of my magic cards in there. There'll be a lot of Dungeons and Dragons work. So yeah, that's great. Will there be any like behind the scenes stuff that you like saved that you haven't shown the, uh, the public? Um. I don't think there is a great deal of that, really. I think there's only one piece I've done which was which was, hasn't been published, and I don't know that I could share that. Anyway, it's probably still under NDA. So oh no, I mean, um, I did it, 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 be any sort of like behind the scenes of making stuff that has already been put out, it featured in the book. Oh, you mean like process shots and, and walkthroughs yeah. and things like that? Okay, no, no. This there might be down the line. I might do some sort of sketchbook or book which shows more process and composition studies and things like that this is just solely going to be the finished final pieces because there's so much work I've got out there which I'd like to share and put together because a lot of people maybe as you say are familiar with my work on magic but they're not necessarily familiar with my work on uh, on Pathfinder or they're not familiar with my work on Dungeons and Dragons or I mean something I'm a company I've been working with a lot in the past couple of years in the UK is called Osprey Games I've been doing a lot of miniature packaging for them so that's sort of thing that a lot of people have seen so the real idea is really to bring all that together into one volume, because I've done a lot of diverse work over the years, um, you know, stylistically, content wise, different companies. And it's just going to be great to bring that all together in one place and, and share that. And hopefully people can see stuff they're not familiar with. And I quite like the idea of that, that, that really about it. What would be a couple of pieces from your career, say one from Dungeons and Dragons and one from uh, Osprey, you said? that you would list as examples of say your, you know, greatest hits? Uh, well, there's one piece that I particularly did for Dungeons & Dragons, which was the Neverwinter campaign setting, which was a book cover, which I particularly liked, which is an undead dragon with the Neverwinter uh, city in the background. Uh, I mean, other ones, I did the, the uh, Scoundrels of Schoolport board game, I particularly liked that one. There was one I did for Dragon Magazine, which I've called Stalwart, which is a bit of a reference really to Larry Elmore's classic red box cover um uh the oathmark pieces uh, which is the the osprey games when i've done the, the games called oathmark it's a miniature tabletop miniature game yeah. um there was some goblin cavalry which i did which got into spectrum which is the the uh the juried art book which i was particularly pleased with yeah there's a, well i've done a lot of work a lot of people i'm quite happy with really <laughs> <laughs> and um the final question is if you had to pick a artist living or dead like anyone that you could have over for dinner, uh, maybe a few drinks. Who would that artist be, and why would you choose them? Gosh, I don't know. That's a tough one, really. Yeah, because there'd be lots of different motivations for why you might have different artists out there. Um, yeah, <laughs> I find that too hard to answer in some ways, really. But I mean, someone that I think is just just amazing artist, just the sheer amount of variety and stuff he did of the quality. Was John Singer Sargent? He'd be an interesting person to talk to. So, yeah, he was a was John the, Singer Sargent. 
Ah, yes, yes. Yeah, just because, yeah, just just to sort of be in awe of him, really. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Well, I appreciate you again. Yeah, I feel. But one, well, one oh. thing I would say, you know, very, I feel very fortunate about certainly within the sort of games, fans of the art community, is that it is a very friendly community, and and I feel very fortunate to have gone to lots of conventions and met my peers and met, you know, different generations of artists. So I feel very fortunate to have met a lot of artists and to consider. A great number of them, my friends really. It's surprising how you make really good friendships just seeing people once a year at the show and being familiar with their art and what have you. It's it's a it's a great community to be part of. I feel very fortunate. Yeah, I'd, I I've heard that from a lot of you guys, like pretty much all of them are, that I can imagine. Like you guys are very close knit. There is a great amount of affection that goes on between the artists. That yeah, work. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yes. It's very cool because that is a, in an industry where uh, it would be easy to pit people against one another. It's nice to see that kind of camaraderie. Well, that's true, because be, ostensibly we're all competing for the same jobs, but thankfully there's not enough work to go around, and everyone's, you know, supportive of each other. I think everyone wants to see everyone else's career do well, and, you know, we delight in it when someone else is doing well, and that's nice, you know, that's, that's great. Well, I thank you so much again for, for taking the time today, and uh, I apologise for the snafus in uh my oh, stuff. well yeah I, amazing, I think it's amazing i think it's amazing that we can sit here and do this you know that's that's something in itself isn't it <laughs> yeah it is crazy it is crazy to think that there's a satellite that's beaming this information at like <laughs> the speed of light over i don't know the speed of whatever i'm not sure light i'm yeah. not I'm a scientist but it's just it's really fast is what i'm saying Yes, it is. It is. Yes. Anyway, it's has been. Thanks very much for inviting me to do this. It's been a pleasure to meet you, and and I'm, I'm very happy to talk about my work and stuff. And I'm glad you're interested to hear about it. Well, thank you again. I appreciate it. You have a good day. How did you like that? I must confess, I tried really hard not to imitate the accent. It's so much fun to do. Maybe I'll do it now. Ah, hey, it's been a crazy couple of months. Wait, that's Welsh. Well, now I feel self-conscious. Anyway, that's it for tonight, so until next time, I've got a scope.